Ever feel like you're doing this teaching thing alone? You don't have to be. Share Teaching is all about sharing the workload through the power of collaboration and teamwork. Together, we'll walk through all the difficult parts of teaching and learn how to streamline our processes, fine tune our time management, and develop a more manageable workload. If that sounds like a dream come true to you, then welcome to the Shared Teaching Podcast. Let's share in the teaching to make those dreams a reality. Now here's today's Shared Teaching. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Shared Teaching Podcast. I'm your host, Susan, and I'm so happy to have you here for episode number 105, where we're talking all about some of my favorite teacher organization ideas. Because it's towards the end of this, well, I would say school year. I wish it was the end of the school year. It's getting towards the end of the calendar year, which is always the perfect time to kind of reset, reevaluate, and start fresh when we come back to school after our Christmas breaks, winter breaks, and January is coming, right? January is always the best time to like reset and set some new goals. So as a teacher, having those very clear systems for how to stay organized can really save you a lot of time in your day, and we all need every minute we can spare as teachers. So the first thing I want to talk about is paper, because that is, I think, the biggest source of maybe frustration and chaos in a lot of classrooms, at least the ones I've seen. When teachers tend to be disorganized, it tends to be papers, right? They just kind of pile up everywhere. So if you've ever watched any organizing shows or maybe hoarders, which is kind of a guilty pleasure of mine, they always kind of start off by taking an inventory of the types of things that people have or that they collect. And then they kind of go through the daunting task of sorting all of the items from this person's house into these main categories. So we're going to start that same way to tackle our papers. We're going to identify the main categories of the papers that we receive as a teacher. So just some examples to get you thinking are maybe office memos, assessments, classwork, parent notes. There may be a few other things in there that I'm forgetting, but those to me are like the most, the things we get the most often. So once we know those bigger categories, we want to think through how we're going to handle these papers. So just imagine you're touching the papers as few times as possible in order to deal with them quickly and efficiently. So organizers say this all the time too, like just put your hand on it, make a quick decision, move on, right? So we want to do that with our paper categories. What am I going to do with this paper that doesn't get it shuffled from place to place to place and then it just kind of piles up? How can I take this paper, make a quick and efficient decision on it, and then just be done with it? So if if I receive like a memo from the office, I need to decide if I'm going to keep it or do I have to do something with it? Does it have a date that it needs to be returned, right? Sometimes it's a attendance sheet you need to sign and give back to the attendance clerk. Does it need to be passed out to students? Is it just like a stack of flyers about an upcoming event? and I just need to like pass it out to the kids. Is it some kind of information that's gonna pertain like only to me? And let's say the memo is maybe a reminder on completing report card comments, right? Because that's coming up. I can make note of the date in my planner or put it on my digital calendar, and then I can toss the memo. Or maybe I wanna keep it in the wall file near my desk so I can reference it and then throw it away once it's done. So we have to find a method that works for us. So you're gonna decide How exactly am I dealing with things like this? Once we have that decision up front, it's kind of like a behavior plan. Once we know how we're going to respond with student behaviors, then when they occur, we're ready for them, right? So we're going to take that same mentality when it comes to our paper organization. So decision time, right? So now we know our categories. We really need to think through how we're going to tackle these categories, And once we decide that, we have an easy decision when they come in that they're not going to pile up, they're not going to become unmanageable, they're not going to become lost, right? Because we know exactly what to do. 
So once we decide that, we're going to design our teacher organization system. Now, there's a couple different ways to do this, and it's really just personal preference. What works best for you? Do you like it kind of out of sight, out of mind? Are you the kind of person that likes things organized behind like closed doors? Or do you want to see it so you know where it is? Do you need it out in the open in some way? So rather than having piles just on your desk, maybe you want to look into like a stacked letter tray system. If you like things put away behind a closed door so it looks nice and organized, maybe you want what I have, which is like the Sterilite drawer organizers where you just open the drawer, pop it in, close the drawer. Nobody knows how much paper is in there and it stays in an organized way. And then when someone comes into your room, they're not feeling like there's a lot of clutter everywhere because it's contained, right? So some other options are hanging files. So I love to have hanging files that sit on the corner of my desk, and it's just an open hanging file system that has file folders in it. And I've talked about this on the podcast before, and I have a file for each each day of the week. So there's a hanging file for Monday through Friday. And then within the hanging files are file folders that are labeled by day of the week and then subject. So all my Monday things are together in a hanging file folder. And then, sorry, my puppy decided to knock a few things over. So I have file folders by days of the week. And then within the days of the week are subject folders like just regular manila file folders, and I like colors, so mine have different colors. So I have maybe one for science slash social studies, since we don't do it every day of the week. Then I have a math one and a reading one and so on. So I put the copies in the correct file folders, and then I sort those by days of the week. So when the next week comes, or even that week, I know exactly what to grab and where it is for passing out the papers to my class. So I always like to have two weeks of materials at a time, and I don't like to do more than two weeks because things happen, right? They might suddenly change curriculum. Maybe they want you to focus on a different standard. The kids aren't learning that lesson, so maybe you need to reteach. So there's always something that happens that might derail your plan. So I try not to do too far in advance so that I don't have to go back and redo things later. Working with just two weeks ahead also is very helpful when you need a sub in a pinch because you don't even have to go into school. You can just say, okay, type up my plan, send it to a coworker, they can print it out, and then you just tell the sub, hey, you'll find things in the hanging file folder on my desk with today's date labeled on it, right? And they know exactly where to find your copies. Now, when I taught fourth grade as an ELA teacher, I was in a departmentalized grade level. So I taught ELA, another teacher taught just math. So I had different file boxes for each group that I saw. And I only had two groups because there was a tiny team of two of us on the fourth grade team at this school. And so I had a class I called 4A because fourth grade and a class that I called 4B and they knew which box they belonged to, and then each student had a number and their name on a file in the box. So each box was duplicated, if this makes sense. One for A and one for B. And then I also had a second set so that I had an incoming and then an outgoing. Now you could use the same set, but I really prefer to have them separated Because the disadvantage of having just one file is if your grading starts to pile up, it gets mixed in with the already graded work when a student has it picked up their file. So let me explain that a little bit more clearer. I had students place their work in their file folder with their name and number on it, and it went in numerical order according to who was where on my grade sheet when I did my grades, and then I could just easily pull the file out, grade it, And then I put that, transferred it into their other file box that was the graded file box. So I had an ungraded box and a graded box, and they're both duplicated. There was no difference between them other than I was just putting the files from one to the other once they were graded. That worked for me because it was a smaller set of students. There is um, different ways you can do it if you have larger classes. So for example, Kelly Ann of the Crafty Teacher Lady shares that she uses a 
color coding system that's blue, red, green, and yellow for her grading process. And as she moves through the grading process, the papers go in different colored file folders according to what that file meant. She also uses a stacked letter tray that just sits on the corner of her desk. And one of them is specific for late assignments, which I thought was a really cool idea, especially if your grading policy needs you to take late work into account. Mine does not. They do not care if it's late. They do not care if it's a zero. There are no zeros. Pretty much everyone gets a trophy, but that's a different subject for a whole nother day. So if you need to know who's turning in things late, have a late bucket, have a late file, have something that designates them turning it in late so that you know if it's in that section, that's what it is. You can read more about it on her blog, and I will link to it in the show notes. And I want to know, what are your best teacher organization ideas? I always welcome comments. If you want to go to Apple Podcasts, you can leave a review and talk about how much you love this episode, if you have any thoughts about it, if you have your own ideas and ways of organizing, if you learned something new that you wanted to share with others that was helpful, that is always a great thing to leave in a review. Plus, it makes me excited to see that people really are listening and care about what I'm talking about every week. So thank you so much for tuning in for another episode, and I will see you next week. Bye for now. If you've loved this show, then join me in sharing the teaching, hitting that subscribe button, and leaving us a review on iTunes, so we can be found by more teachers like you who are ready to start sharing the workload. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Find new episodes each week on shareteaching.com. Thanks for listening to the Share Teaching Podcast. Podcast.